Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our auditorium Bible class. Glad to have you here tonight. Let's all stand, please. We'll get started. And if you want to take your song books, it should be on the screen. Page 278, I Am Resolved. We're going to do the first, second, third, and fifth verses. Page 278. Sing it out tonight. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad. over to page 481, I believe I said it right, uh oh, I take that back, yeah, 481, search me, oh God, before we do this, uh, I want to read a verse from the word of God, where I believe this, this uh, verse came from, and it's Psalms chapter 139, now if you know anything about that chapter, that's where it says that God knows everything, he sees everything, he says you can see wherever you're at, he's there, and all that, but the two verses, the last two verses, verses 23 and 24, are actually the words of this song, and it says on, here it says, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And so this is what this song, I think, and uh, this is a beautiful song, and we're gonna do all four verses, page 481. Search me, O oh God, and all my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be. Oh, 
Thank you. You may be seated. Brother Jim. That was a very appropriate song for our lesson, for the request for revival, as ours is right around the corner. We're going to go over our prayer and praise list uh, this evening. And I apologize that we don't have the outline. Uh, I don't know what happened. So we'll see if we can't. Well, we won't have it next week either because next week's our revival. So just so you're well aware of that, next, starting next Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'll be here every night. And uh, so if we take our prayer and praise list out, our first thought is our missionary of the week out of the Cleveland Baptist Church, and that's Bob and Becky Mack in the Ivory Coast. Our preacher of the week in Broadview Heights, that's where I live, that's Joel Royalty. And you know, I was talking to somebody in the neighborhood, not close in the neighborhood, at the rec center, and uh, he lives real close to Joel Royalty. And he said, uh, he, has some, he has some strange ideas, but, but his kids are the best kids you'd ever want to meet. And I mean, I, I should tell Joel that, I haven't seen him, but every father loves to hear that, that's for sure. And he does have a wonderful family. And uh, our College of the Week, Pensacola. Our first responder of the week, Kevin Petrie, right here from our church at the Cleveland Police Department. We have our state's leaders, our country's leaders, our staff members, the Folgers, the Becks, the Blankenships, and more Blankenships. All right, then if we go inside, our health request. Uh, Dale Chambers is there in the first column, and I think, I think he's battling dementia. I'm not positive about that, but we want to remember him. And then in the middle column there at the top is Faith Thompson. We certainly want to remember her. I hope she got some cards from our class last week. And then over in the right column, uh, Mrs. Lois Ingle, still on our prayer request. Roseanne Farnsworth there in the middle. Down a little bit lower, Terry Brooks uh, with his quadruple bypass surgery. We certainly want to remember him. And then I got a special request tonight from Mrs. Mosier. Her son, Kevin, underwent surgery today. Surgery on his hand. It seems like his, his, his uh, smallest two fingers on his hand were getting numb. And so they had to do surgery up here on a nerve up in his, in his, uh, near his elbow area. So he's recovering. We pray that, uh, that he'll make a full and complete recovery and that pain will be gone. That would be great. So remember him. If uh, we go over to our special request, right there at the bottom of the first column is our hurricane that's approaching. I think it was last week that I, I thanked the Lord for, for our good weather and boy, it's a different story, but we're still going to thank the Lord. I guess we needed this rain, but uh, the people in Florida, they've got, it, they've got a serious problem here. And we want to we wanna lift them up in prayer. I'm sure that most of us know somebody that's in the area or in the path of that hurricane, and we want to remember them in prayer at this time. The Lord can work through this, that's for sure. And then uh, on our cancer list, we have our three Davids. On um, the first column, Donna Gillis Giles, I want to remember, or Gillis, I'm sorry, want to remember her uh, recovering and her, her biopsy. Down at the bottom, Sister Fran Palmazano, we want to remember her. She's here tonight, and we're thankful for that. Jim Chait in the middle. These are people that I'm, people that I'm familiar with and that, I'm, that I know personally. Pat Croy over on the right-hand column, and Paul Foradora. I, I don't know this for sure, but I think Paul is making, making a pretty good recovery. We want to want to pray that that will continue. And then uh, we also have Mrs. Janet Rickman, who's uh, got something going on. She's got to be home and want to pray that she'll, make, that she'll make a recovery. If we go over to the back side, we have different missionaries out of our church. Uh, we've got notes or cards to be sent to three people there. And then I just wanted to announce that uh, we still need nursery workers for the revival next Sunday night. Probably Sunday night's taken already, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we need some nursery workers for next, next week's revival. All right, then I also have a couple of prayer requests that were given to me. This is Diane Miller. Uh, she's recovering from COVID. She's been sick for three weeks now, so it's 
really taking a long time for Diane. We want to remember her. And then uh, Jason Sheffy, a lot of us know the Sheffy family. They're in Florida, and they're in the path of this storm. And there's been no communication from him yet today. So that makes, that makes uh, their loved ones a little bit nervous, as we can understand that. Then I've, set, I've tried to take prayer requests, and if there's somebody here that can speak loud, I'll take their prayer request. Anybody that has one tonight, I'll jot it down. I have a microphone, but to run back and give it to you, I don't know that it would work. So, if, yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. How you turn it on? Uh, it should be on. Okay. Ted. Anybody else? I'm sorry. Your brother Alan is. Okay. Remember ever? Hi, um, my name's uh, Sister Mine. I need a prayer, uh, prayer request. Seems like the devil been attacking me here lately, and all I've been doing is coming to church, going to channels. That's all I do. Well, we know the devil's going to attack us whenever we do something for him. Did you say that was a, a grandfather? Grandson. Okay. Bruce? Okay, pray for uh, Oma Coulter. My understanding is she's very near death. Mm. So that, uh, all right, so we've got uh, Alan who needs some spiritual needs, ever down there in uh, Honduras, and uh, he's trying to get to the United States, and they've had the paperwork in now for five or six months, and it's still not come through yet, so we're going to pray for that. Uh, then the, the devil's attacking our sister back there, all right. Then uh, we have a grandson in the hospital. They still don't know what's wrong with him, right? David? Uh, the U.S. State Department is advising all American citizens in Russia to get out of the country, so that will apply to James and uh, Amber uh, Prager's family. I had not heard that. All right, so I think we've got these pretty well. The Prangers there in Russia, as the State Department's uh, asking for all U.S. citizens to leave. And Bruce mentioned Oma Coulter. And so let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for our opportunity to meet tonight. We thank you, Lord, for our church, for our church family, for the facilities that you've provided for us here, Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you for it's nice and dry. It's warm because it's not outside, Lord. So we thank you for these these uh, facilities that you've given to us. Lord, we want to pray for these people on our list, the Max over in the Ivory Coast. We pray for them, Lord. Thank you for your work on, in their lives. We want to remember Joe Royalty, the pastor of Broadview Heights Baptist, Lord, and ask that you would strengthen him. We thank you for his work there. Uh, Kevin Petrie, our Cleveland Police Department, right here out of our church, Lord. We ask that you would protect him. We ask that you would give him strength. We ask that you would guide him in all that he does. Not an easy job, Lord. Thank you for his service to us. 
Lord, we want to remember our staff, Pastor Pete and uh, Sandra. We want to remember Tom and, and his wife, Lord, and I think they're on vacation this very minute. Please protect them, Lord. Give them a good little time of rest while they're away. We want to remember our cancer patients. Uh, pray for Paul Fordora, Lord, and ask that uh, you would indeed bring him back to us soon. Thank you for Fran and that she's able to be with us, Lord. Please strengthen her. For our Davids, David Cooper and David Alleygood and David Farley, Lord, we want to pray for them. We want to remember these names, Lord, and ask that you would, that you would bless these people. For, for Kevin Mosier, Lord, who just had that surgery today, pray for him. Lord, we have a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of your people that are in the way of this hurricane down in Florida, Lord. And we pray that you would protect them. We pray that you would uh, guide them. I'm sure many of them are trying to make their way out. I've seen pictures on the news of the long traffic lines trying to, trying to get out of Florida. Lord, please, we ask for your protection on our loved ones and on your children down there, Lord. Then I want to remember also our, uh, uh, our special requests that were here in our auditorium tonight, Lord. We had... Uh, this brother, Alan, who has spiritual needs, Lord, we ask that you would meet those needs. I know that many of us have unsaved loved ones, Lord, and we ask for your, we ask for your conviction on them and your drawing on them, Lord. We want to remember uh, Ever down there in Honduras, and Lord, we know that uh, he would love to be able to come here and to visit, and uh, to visit family here to visit this church, and we would love to have them, Lord. We pray that you, would, that you would make that work out. Seems like we have plenty of people in the country that don't belong and have gotten here illegally, Lord. It seems like uh, in our finite way of thinking, it seems like ever, ever should be able to come here, Lord, and we ask that, that you would meet that need. We pray for Oma Coulter, who's near death, and uh, we pray that you would give her peace at such a, at such a time as this, Lord. We pray for this one that feels attacked by the devil, oh Lord, and we know that your word says it. If we are doing something for you, that we can bet that, the, that Satan is going to attack us. And we, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen her, help her to remember that if she, would, if she will, will resist the devil, that he will flee from her, Lord. Please help her with this issue. Now we pray also, Lord, for the prangers and... Uh, we hear that, this, that the State Department has made this announcement about U.S. citizens in Russia. We ask that you would please uh, protect the prankers. We hear about them drafting citizens to uh, fight. And Lord, anything can happen over there. We don't know what could happen. We just ask that you would protect your people, protect your people over there. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, like I said, we don't have an outline tonight, so... We'll just go, we'll go with what we've got. We'll pay attention here. Our verse is, uh, our verse for the week, our verse that we're going to be speaking of is at Galatians 2.20, probably a familiar verse, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Going to open our outline here, talking about our flesh's funeral, dying to self, and putting our putting our our uh, fleshly life to death. And uh, our overview says Christians who desire to have victory over sin must identify with the death of Christ on the cross and then die to themselves, killing the old man and its sinful tendencies. This decision to die to self to sinful choices and desires, and to identify with Christ must be made on a continual basis because Satan is continually tempting people to give in to their fleshly desires. Christians should seek to live in daily denial to self. They need to attend their flesh's funeral. Their flesh's funeral. I'm going to read a little story here for you. This is how our, our lesson opens up. Surviving to tell the story, Brad Kavanaugh and Deborah Killey were the only two survivors of a five-passenger sunken yacht in 1982. 1982. Intending to arrive in Florida, Brad Kavanaugh, Deborah Killey, John Lipoth, Meg Mooney, and Mark Adams all boarded a yacht in Maine for a routine trip. 
Now, that doesn't sound routine to me if you're heading to Florida from Maine, but maybe they were experienced. I don't know, but they, said they thought of it as a routine trip. When they left that morning, the weather reports indicated that the seas were safe for sailing. However, by the second night, the waves were cresting between 35 and 45 feet, and the winds were staying between 70 and 90 knots. The Kavanaugh, or Kavanaugh and Killy both attentively watched the storms, while in the meantime, the other three began to drink. For 11 hours, Kavanaugh and Killy watched the destructive, turbulent conditions. Finally, the other three said that they were sober enough to keep watch so that Kavanaugh and Killy could get some rest. Their rest soon ceased as they were awakened by rising waters in the ship. Adams and Lipoth had fallen asleep on duty and had lashed the steering wheel. As the ship had drifted, as the ship had drifted aimlessly further into the sea, the ship began sinking into shark-infested waters in the Atlantic Ocean. For the next few days, the crew lived on an inflatable rescue boat, suffering through a plethora of adverse conditions. They drifted further into the sea while desperately hoping for a ship to find them. Within a few days, Lipoth, Mooney, and Adams were dead. After four miserable days on the inflatable boat, the two remaining survivors were finally rescued by a Russian ship that took them to the Coast Guard. They lived to tell the story of the danger of drifting. We're going to talk about drifting today. And... Uh, I see here, for each God-given spiritual victory we experience in our lives, the devil will try to cause us to drift from our spiritual commitments and decisions. Whether the struggle, struggle is physical, emotional, or spiritual in nature, the devil will tempt us to get off course, to stray from our original position of victorious Christian living. In the story of Killian Kavanaugh and their crew, it's a sad reminder that, that drifting can be a dangerous pattern, whether it's drifting at sea or whether it's drifting in our personal lives. There are two facts that we want to talk about about drifting. Two facts. Number one, it's often gradual. Drifting is often gradual. I think of, I think of maybe a, a married couple, and they don't have a big knockdown, drag out fight, but they, they, they have different interests. They have different... Uh, thoughts, different plans, different goals, and they start to drift apart. They start to spend less time with each other, and it isn't long before it's, it's irre, re, how do you say it, irreconcilable? Okay, easy for me to say. But, but it ends in a divorce. It ends in divorce. And it, like I said, it wasn't a big knockdown, drag out fight. It was just slowly, slowly drifting apart. It's often gradual. Then number two, the number two uh, fact I want to say about drifting is it's often not noticeable to the person that's drifting. Often not noticeable to the person who's drifting. And this one I think of is church attendance. And I can think of a person, you know, who comes faithfully and maybe the kids are gone. I know you know, and it's a little bit easier. After all, you don't have to take the kids to church. You know, it's a special meeting. It's revival. No, I don't have to go to that. I've worked all day. Pretty soon, it's every Wednesday night, every Sunday night. And they don't have it in their plans. It's, it's not like they said, I'm just going to stop going to church. They just, they just drifted, and they didn't, they didn't even notice that they're drifting before, they, before you know it. They're out of church. We've all seen people that that's happened to. When we make decisions for Christ, surely none of us plans for failure. But it is in our human nature to gradually allow decisions to become less important to us. If we are not careful, we won't even notice the subtle change or drifting that takes place in our hearts as time goes by. You know, oftentimes if you, if you bring the, the uh, offense up or the issue up to the, to the couple or to the, the church attender who's, who's drifting away, many, many times they'll deny it. Many times they'll, uh, they'll make excuses. I know, I know what it's like with our junior church. You know, somebody gets caught messing around, talking when they shouldn't be talking, or kicking the kid in front, and they deny it. I mean, you saw it happen, and they deny it. Or they make excuses. Hey, remember, we used to hear the devil made me do it. We remember that. The devil made me do it. Well, hey, the devil didn't make you do it, but the devil may have tempted you, because we know what the devil does. In, in 1 Peter 5, 8, 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, 
Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And just like the devil is giving our sister here a hard time, that's what the devil wants to do to all of us. He's walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we're talking about being crucified with Christ. One of the easiest verses to drift away from is this verse, Galatians 2.22. The transforming truths found in this verse often or they offer the key to victory over sin. The key is to be crucified with Christ, to be dead to your sinful flesh. To be crucified with Christ means that our old sin nature is crucified. It's dead. It no longer has power over us. The Bible calls this old sinful nature the old man, the old man. And it teaches us that we are free from serving this old sinful nature. I didn't say that we would never sin anymore. I just said that we were free from serving this old sinful nature. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Today I'm going to invite you to a, to a changing of a life-changing moment, attending your own funeral. This funeral is one that you will attend daily. You must attend daily. To, to kill our sinful flesh, we have to do it daily because every day Satan's after us. Let's take a look at five facts about our flesh's funeral. Number one, if you had an outline, it would be, it's a personal funeral. It's a personal funeral. If you look at that verse, <clears throat> Galatians 2.20, there are eight personal pronouns. Now, I didn't know what a personal pronoun was, but if I read the verse enough times, I could figure it out. It's either me or I. Eight times it's used in that verse. So there are, dying to self is a personal decision. Christ paid my sin debt. It was a debt that I could not pay. It was a debt that none of us could pay. Christ's death for me was my salvation. For you, it was your salvation. We must put our trust in him for salvation. But our death to sin is our sanctification. My death with Christ is my sanctification. It's a continual process that provides victory in my Christian life. Being crucified with Christ is an act of being identified with him. We identify with him through daily dying to our old man and choosing to allow Christ to live, with, live through us instead. That was number one, a personal funeral. Number two, it's painful. And in this case, I'm changing the word funeral to death. It's a painful death. It's interesting to note in our text that Paul doesn't simply say that he died with Christ. Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he wrote that he was crucified with Christ. To be crucified involves much pain and agony. And this verb offers an entirely different perspective to the process of dying to self. We are familiar with, uh, with crucifixion. We've talked about it many times in, in church, in, and the thought is the actual death, as a kid I can remember thinking, well, Jesus was crucified to the cross. His hands were nailed. His feet were nailed. He just hung there until all his blood was gone and he was dead. But it was so much, it's so much worse than that. It's suffocation. You've heard how they're, they're hung and they, they have to lift themselves up to get a breath and then relax and sink back down and pull themselves up. And you can only do that so long. And they get weaker and weaker until they finally suffocate to death. It's a terrible death, a terrible way to die. It's very barbarous. I can't... I can't, uh, well, that's the way we are as people. We are, we are barbaric, that's for sure. So many of us, we're not so much afraid of dying. We're afraid of the process, how it's going to happen. I mean, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody really wants to go today unless, you know, they can go, in their, go through their sleep or something. That's, if I ask you, how would you like to die? That's what you would probably say. Well, I'd like to just go to sleep and wake up in heaven. And hey, I'll vote for that myself. That sounds, that sounds like a great way to go. Unfortunately, it's not, all that, it's not all that easy. And putting our flesh to death is a painful death. It's a painful death because it's against us. It's against what we want. It's against what we, what we think. When, when uh, we talk about uh, crucifixion, you know, the body still wants to breathe. And that's why 
they pull themselves up to get that breath. The heart still wants to beat. The mind still wants to think. In our personal lives, in our, in our fleshly lives, our heart still wants to lust. And we try to put that, that heart to death. It still wants to lust. It still, wants, it still has pride. It, it still wants to commit all the sins that it's, that it's happy doing. It's rebellion. It's pride. So it's a, painful, it's a painful death. Our flesh loves our sinful desires and will keep, fight to keep us from surrendering them. Notice what Paul said in Romans 7, 18. We will most likely understand the inward battle he faces as he struggled with his flesh. This is Romans 7, 18 through 25, and it's going to be familiar to you. And it's, well, I'll just read it. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I should do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And I think all of us can probably relate to this. The things that I want to do, the good that I want to do, I find myself not doing it. And things I don't want to do, there I'm doing it. There I'm thinking it. It's just, it's staying with me. Paul, the apostle, the great missionary of the New Testament, admitted that his flesh fought against him. It doesn't matter how spiritually mature we may be. Funerals are always painful, and our flesh's funeral is no exception. But through identifying with Christ's sufferings, we will ultimately find the joy that this world can never give us. Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to compete... I'm sorry. For the, for, I'll just start over. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It makes me think, it will be worth it all. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. We, we could have sung that one tonight, Virgil. We, Virgil asked me Sunday, hey, what's a, good, what's a good song to sing in our lessons? And nothing came to me, but he picked a, he picked a good one tonight, two good ones tonight. Inevitably, we will face hardships and trials from without in addition to our inward struggles. So we're going to have inward struggles as we try to, try to put sin behind us, try to put our sin to death, try to crucify it on the cross. But we're still going to face outward struggles also. All right. So many Christians from around the world have identified with Christ's suffering, some even in physical death. While we may not experience suffering to this extent, we may lose a job or be forced to pay a fine or have somebody laugh at us or get labeled as a preacher boy or something else. I mean, but we all are going to suffer something externally. And I remember reading in, in Acts how the early church, when they suffered, when they were, they were beaten and told, don't you ever preach in the name of Jesus again, they counted themselves they counted themselves they were happy because they were worthy of his of his suffering all right and that's that's what will happen if we suffer or are treated wrongfully for our faith don't be discouraged rejoice we are privileged to identify with Christ and his sufferings and because of this we can enjoy closer fellowship with him first peter 4 12 through 14 beloved think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So we still have something to rejoice about even when we go through uh, trials for his sake. Number three is it's a powerful funeral. 
I wrote, it's powerful, but not sorrowful. So while funerals are very hard services to attend sometimes because of the sorrow that accompanies them, the funeral for your flesh will be one of the most powerful and life-changing funerals that you will experience. Number one, you are alive. If we don't put our flesh to death, if we try to serve our flesh and the Lord, it's like we're neither alive nor dead. And this might sound crazy, but it's like a zombie. It's like a zombie. I remember seeing movies of, of zombies, you know, and they just, they walk and maybe they don't talk, but uh, they're not really dead and they're not really alive. And that's how our spiritual life will be. We'll just be like mediocre, just not really alive and not really dead. But you are alive. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Because of your funeral, you have life. By dying to yourself and your old nature, you can have new life in Christ. Talk about a transforming truth. That's what our lessons are about. In Romans 6, 8 through 11, we read, if, I, if now we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. How comforting it is to know that our life is not defined by the old man and the old sinful nature, but it's de defined by identifying with our new life with Jesus Christ. We're alive in him. We are also free. Before you were saved, you were a, strong, you were a slave to the stronghold of, stronghold of sin. But now you are no more under the power of sin. We mentioned earlier that when we die to ourselves, our, tr our flesh will try to convince us that we need to keep functioning with our old sinful nature. But through this powerful funeral, we can become victorious over that nature. We are no longer the servants of sin. We have been freed from the bondage, and now we are free to follow Christ. The old man goes kicking and screaming when, when we... Uh, give our life completely to the Lord and ask for his, his blessing and his, uh, him to take away our sin and to, uh, to, when we nail that sin to the cross and crucify it. In this, our, we have an illustration here about the Israeli, Israelite children. They were traveling after they were freed from Egypt. And if you remember, it wasn't long after they were freed and they came up against the Red Sea. And now Pharaoh had changed his mind again. And uh, he had sent the armies after him, go get them, go bring them back. And here they were up against the Red Sea. And as you all know, God did a wonderful miracle. He, he, he opened that Red Sea. They walked across on dry ground. They walked across. And, and an equally impressive uh, miracle was that the whole Egyptian army was drowned in the waters after the Israelites were across. And we think of that Red Sea and that... Uh, we, we identify with that as, as our salvation because Christ at that point, he, he saved or he redeemed his people, his people. And that's, that's, our, that's a picture of our salvation. But there was another body of water that the Israelites crossed, and it wasn't until many years later when they crossed the Jordan River. The Jordan River was much smaller than the Red Sea, but when they crossed the Jordan River, that was like, they got the blessing that God had promised them. They were now in the promised land. Once again, they crossed on dry land. No less of a miracle, no less of a miracle, but it had a different meaning. It was like their sanctification, their reward. And that's what uh, God had given to them. Though many times we forget about the crossing of the Jordan, it was no less of a miracle than the first crossing at the Red Sea. We often think of salvation as the only miracle in our Christian lives. But the mortification of our flesh and life through Christ is equally powerful. Number four, number four is it's a practical funeral. We're talking about dying to self. It, that might seem like it's not very practical, practical, but it's one of the most practical passages in the Bible. The applications of this verse are many, but here are a few. A would be we die to your old lusts. And lusts are really no more than desires. I know what I think of when I think of lust. It's usually like a sexual sin. 
And, but it can, be, it can be any desire that we have that, that uh, we put in front of the Lord. In our society, we consider lust to be a physical or sexual desire. But this is not exclusively what we are talking about. The things that the old man wants to see or the places that the old man wants to go and the things that he wants to do are all included in this death. So I've come up with a little example of each. The things that we want to see. I remember the story of Jonah. You do too, when he, he was fleeing from God and God turned him around and sent him back to where he had originally wanted him to go. And when he got there, he went into the city of Nineveh and he preached and the people listened and the people repented and they sat in sackcloth and ashes right from the king on everyone down. And Jonah was disappointed. Jonah wanted to see, he wanted to see those sinners punished. He wanted to see God pour out his wrath. After all, they deserved it. Well, you know what? Jonah deserved it too. I remember my brother, he went to, he went to school here at Heritage, my oldest, my, my next in line brother, Jeff. And, and he, had a, he had a classmate and that classmate refused to accept the Lord. And he was in the Christian school, and he, he knew everything. He knew all the stories. He knew what God had done for him, and he just refused. He refused. And I said something to my brother. I said, man, he deserves to go to hell. My brother said, we all do. Man, that was my younger brother kind of slapped me in the face, not physically, but man, he was right. We all do. We all do. Jonah wanted to see those enemies punished. What, what else do I have here? Our, our old lust is where do we want to go? Hey, it sounds good to go belly up to the bar and, and have a few drinks and cry in your beer with your buddies. That's something that the old flesh wants to do. That's something that the old flesh wants to do. But that's not something that we should do. How about something we want to do? Oh, the world tells us to go for the gusto. You only go around once. So get everything you can get. Go for the gusto. Have it your way. That's right. 1 John 2.16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Every wicked thought that holds us, every bitter thought that eats us, every worry that overwhelms us, we die to. We surrender. Those sinful strongholds that our flesh thinks we want, that's our that our flesh even thinks we need, we die to. We refuse to indulge. Every besetting sin that has for so long entangled us has no power over the crucifixion of Christ. Refuse to live in those old lusts, surrender them, kill them, and claim God's power to live victorious over them. Next is we die to our old logic. Not only does the old man have the wrong desires, but he also has the wrong way of thinking. We must also die to the flawed thinking of the old man. And uh, I think about the will of God and I think about what this world thinks when a Christian, what I would say, uh, changes, changes their, their idea and, and wants to do something for the Lord. And I think of Miss Christine Primo, who's you know, a teacher here and she's gonna, she's gonna go be a missionary in Africa. That's wonderful. Just Sunday night, we had uh, the Mac girl who came forward, and she's, she's got this degree in environmental something or other, but she's ecology, okay. She's going to be dedicated. She wants to be a missionary somewhere. And that's, the world would look at that, and the world would say, are you crazy? You've got a good college education. You have a degree. You could do anything. You want to be a missionary? Hey, that's the way the world thinks, but that's not the way we think. That's not the way the Lord wants us to think. You know, the world would say money. Money is the important thing. He who dies with the most toys is the winner. You've probably seen a bumper sticker like that. But hey, that's the way of the world. That's not the way of the Lord. That's not the way of the Lord. How about giving? Giving, tithing. The old man, the old man says, hey, I need all that money. I can't give up 10% of that money. 
I am so thankful as a young man, when I mean young man, I mean just an elementary age boy, I learned the, the lesson of tithing. My mom and dad, I'm so thankful for that lesson of tithing. My grandma would have us over, have us do some hard, hard work. We may have had to wash a window. We had to sweep something up. Maybe we had to cut out papers for her Bible school that summer. And at the end of the day, she'd give us a $10 bill. And $10 bill, that was a lot of money, especially for the little amount of work that we did. But when I got home, I found out that that $10 bill, I had to tithe it. I was only going to have $9 after that. Boy, that, that sort of hurt. But my mom and dad insisted. When they gave us an allowance, they put it out in little stacks. This is your savings, this is your spending, and this is your tithe. Maybe it was a dollar, and it was all divided, you know, two quarters here, one quarter here, something, you know. But it was, oh, we always had to tithe. And that lesson has stayed with me, and I'm so thankful that it has. God has blessed me time and time and time again because of that blessing, because of that lesson, I should say. The will of God. The will of God is not the same as our will. Uh, put that old logic aside and trust in the unseen hand. My dad sings that song, The Unseen Hand. Often the commandments of God are not logical to the world, but when we die to self, we put our logic aside and trust the leading hand of God. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we die to our old logic, our, our, we die to our old lust, and now we die to our old labor. Many people believe that the way to heaven involves good works. And it kind of makes sense. If you're just a worldly guy, kind of makes sense. I mean, uh, the idea of a balance has always made sense. You know, if this starts to go down, add a little to this. You know, many people, they'll just flat out tell you, yeah, I've done more good than I've done bad. I think I'm, I think I'm going to heaven. That's our old labor. One, way, one, one of the defining characteristics of biblical Christianity is the belief that works do not merit eternal life. They do not. So Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we all know that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Those who know Christ don't have to live in fear or worry that their good works outweigh their bad. They have the security of knowing that their sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ and nothing can snatch them out of their Father's hand. John 10, 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. What a reassuring verse that we can never lose our salvation. Amen. However, our flesh still loves to do the things that gain approval from others. And I'm no different than anybody else. And when I have people come up and say, boy, you're doing a great job teaching. We just really love that. I've got to remember, I'm really not here to please you guys. I'm here to please the Lord. I'm here to please the Lord. And my head can get so big because everybody's saying, Hey, you're doing a great job, but it's not about that. As a Christian who is daily dying to self, a Christian who labors for God out of, out of the, a heart of love, not out of a heart of fear or obligation. I'm not here to please people. I'm here to please the Lord. All right, it's a permanent. This is number five. It's a permanent funeral. Christ died once and rose once. When Paul said, I am crucified, the, the verb indicates that it's a one-time event that occurred in the past and that is currently affecting the present. I'm crucified with Christ. The moment you were saved, your flesh died and lost power over you. You simply and continually choose to identify with Christ, fellowship with, or fellowship with him in his suffering, and claim the promise that you can have victory over sin through the power of Christ. While you may drift from your victory in Christ, you can always go back. I can tell you of a, 
of family vacation that we took. We, uh, as, a, as a young kid, I, I want to say junior high school, my parents took us for the first time down to the Florida Keys. And it was a wonderful experience, so wonderful that we've probably been back Oh, five, six, seven times as a family or just as a couple, Joyce and I, or with our kids. And that's when this little episode happened. We went to the Florida Keys on a family vacation. And we stayed at this wonderful campground where they rented us a cabin type situation. And we rented a boat. We rented a big speedboat. And Jeremy, my oldest, he's a big fisherman. And we were going to go out and we were going to be catching all kinds of sea creatures and having a great time on that boat. And of course, you know, when they rented us the boat, they said, uh, you know what you're doing? And, oh yeah, yeah, we know, we know what we're doing. After all, we had a boat up at Finley Lake and it had a, a five horsepower motor and we knew, we knew exactly what we were doing. Okay, well good. And he showed us where the things were and we got our fishing rods and off we went. And uh, we were fishing by the Boca Chica Bridge and there was a strong current through there. But that's okay, because that's where the big fish hung out. At least that's what we were told. So we dropped anchor and tied it to the back of the boat. And I didn't know it at the time, but that's, that's not the right thing to do. When you tie it to the back of the boat, now it's, it's getting pulled. You're getting pulled, and the water is coming right up and coming into the boat. And we struggled and struggled and fought with that thing. And we were scared to death. Finally, we had to cut that line. We had to cut that anchor, and now we were drifting. The, the current was much stronger than I ever anticipated. Now, we didn't drift all that far. It's not like the story I read at the beginning, but we were drifting, and I thought in my mind, if only, if only I could go back to that marina when they were renting us this boat. If only I could tell them, well, no, we don't really have that much experience. Maybe you could explain to us the, a few good pointers on, on taking this boat out. I could have asked him some questions, but I didn't. And I wished I could have been back at that marina. When we start drifting, you know what that's like. If you get out too far, if you lose your sight of land, you, you're in big trouble. If you lose that landmark, you're in big trouble. And as a Christian, if you lose sight of Christ, you're in big trouble. Thankfully, we got back, and uh, we got a chance, and we bought another anchor, and we learned our lesson, although we still had a few close calls on that vacation. Uh, it, was still a, it was still a good time. We were drifting, but the Bible says you can always go back to the marina. You can always go back to the Lord. He's always there for you. He, you know the story of the prodigal son, don't you? We all know that story. He said, give me my share of the money, and he left, and he wasted it. Wasted it on riotous living, the Bible says. And at the end, he, the Bible says, he came to himself, and he remembered what his father's house was like. How the servants had it better than he had it. Right now, he was feeding pigs. He was feeding pigs, and the Bible says he was so hungry, he wanted to eat the pig food. He wanted to eat the slop that he was feeding the hogs. But he, he came to himself and he remembered what his father's house had and he repented. He repented and he went back and he said, I'll, I'll say to my dad, I'll say, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just, just make me as one of your hired servants. Just make, a, make me a servant. At least I'll have a bed. At least I'll have three meals a day. It's a lot better than what I've got now. And when he got home, when he got on the street and his father who had been looking for him every day his father saw him, and his father came running out, and he said, Father, Father, forgive me. You know, just make me as a hired hand. And his dad said, well, all right, let me think about it. No, he didn't say that. His father fell on his neck, hugged him, and kissed him, and welcomed him back home. And that's what our Heavenly Father wants to do. If we are drifting, if we drift away from the promises that we've made to him, if we drift away from our decisions, he still, he'll welcome us back. He'll welcome us back. Maybe you've never made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your savior. I really don't see any, any visitors or any strangers in here today, but maybe you're not, maybe you're not sure. Maybe you've, you're not sure that you've accepted Christ. You could make that, you could make that certain. It would be easy for you to make that certain tonight. 
we'd love to talk to you or show you out of the Bible how you can know that that's a certain thing in your life. But all of us need to, to crucify our sins, crucify that old flesh, and have our own funeral for our own flesh. Lord, thank you for this, this time that we've had together. Lord, thank you for this good lesson. Thank you for the, the things that I've seen in my own life just from reading it daily, Lord, and going over it and over it. Lord, I pray that you will uh, help us to do your will, not to worry about what the old man wants, what the old flesh wants, Lord, but to focus on what you have for us. Thank you, Lord. Once again, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Florida tonight. Pray for protection, Lord, for the prangers tonight, Lord, for their protection too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You're dismissed.